So today I wanted to, so maybe this is a bit of topic, but I'm going to, to talk about an inverse problem, a famous inverse problem, the Calderon problem, and uh, I wanted to report some, some work I did with uh, some colleagues in my department, uh, Juan Antonio Barcelo, who's been working in stability issues and inverse problems for a very long time, and Los Castro, who works in numerics, Cristobal Meronio, who is a uh, recently joined the team, and uh, Daniel Sanchez-Mendoza, who's a postdoc uh, at our group. And uh, recently we joined forces with uh, Thierry Daudet at Besançon and François Nicolo at Nantes. So I'm going to, to report on this work. So I assume that not everyone is 100% uh, familiar with the Calderon problem, so we will we'll, uh, do uh, an introduction about this inverse problem, and then I'll a switch to, to the, the things we've done. So the Calderon problem, also known as inverse conductivity problem, it's about uh, recovering the conductivity of a body uh, via measurements made only at the boundary. Okay? So I, I've phrased it in terms of conductivity, but if you like your geophysics, there's also formulation in terms of geophysics and waves. And so it's, a, it's a quite a general framework for a class of inverse problems that uh, have numerous applications. So, uh, funny thing, Calderon was an engineer at the time working at the uh, Argentinian State Company. And, uh, he published uh, this work very late in his career. I think it's in the late 80s. But uh, apparently he came with his idea when he was working at IPFE before going to Chicago and doing his PhD. So, so the problem, uh, there are many ways of stating this. There is a more geometrical one and less geometrical one. So I, I chosen uh, the simplest one, which is uh, suppose that you have a domain in RD with a smooth boundary. If you like, uh, you can also think about a manifold, a compact manifold with boundary equipped with a Riemannian metric. So the problem uh, consists in the following. So you, you are given a, a, sorry. A conductivity, which is a matrix that is symmetric, positive, definite, and so and so and so, and you consider the associated elliptic operator uh, with Dirichlet boundary conditions. Okay, so under these conditions, the problem is solvable. If you are in a Riemannian manifold, then this would be usually the Laplace-Beltrami operator, and then you would have the normal, the, the Dirichlet condition as well. So U is an electrostatic potential. Issued from some uh, some uh, some current f, and then uh, you you measure the current through the boundary. Uh, we are going current, which is simply the normal derivative uh, of the solution uh, restricted to the boundary. So this is the PDE that is involved in this Calderon problem. Okay, and what is the the main object of the talk? The main object is the Dirichlet to Neumann map which is a linear map that uh, maps infinity functions on the boundary to infinity functions on the boundary in the following way. So you take uh, the Euclid condition f, you solve the PDE, and then you compute the normal derivative at the boundary. Okay? And this is a linear map that is well defined. And uh, this is called the Dirichlet to Neumann map. So the Calderon problem is essentially, uh, uh, can you can the knowledge of this operator determine in a unique way the conductivity A? This is the question. Okay? Of course, there is a straightforward non-uniqueness in this problem, which comes from the fact that if you have a, a diffeomorphism of your domain omega that fixes the boundary and you pull back, you push forward your, your metric A with this diffeomorphism, then you will get a, a different uh, matrix A which has the same Dirichlet to Neumann operator. Okay. So there is a this trivial non-uniqueness in the problem. So the question by Calderon is, is this the only uh, non-uniqueness source? Or there is uh, some, some other kind of types of non-uniqueness? And well, in case you have uniqueness, of course, the very interesting question is to effectively 
uh, recover A from this operator. So there are essentially two questions. First, is the, uni the inverse problem uh, meaningful? I mean, uh, you can uh, recover A from the operator, modulo this, this gauge invariance. And uh, the second one, which is also very important, uh, compute effectively the, the conductivity, the metric A from the operator. Okay, so this is a very famous problem, has been studied by a lot of people. And essentially the, the main questions are the following. So I like to phrase it uh, the following way. So consider phi, which is uh, the mapping that, uh, that maps the set of admissible conductivities, modulo this equivalence relation, the um, two conductivities are equivalent if and only if there is a different phi that signs one another and that fixes the boundary. Okay, so if you take equivalence classes by this uh, equivalence relation, you have a well-defined map from, uh, from uh, here to the, to the class of bounded linear operators from the boundary, to, from C infinity of the boundary to itself. Okay, so uniqueness is essentially uh, deciding whether or not this map is injective. Okay? So not from the very beginning that this is a very nonlinear map. Okay, so it's not linear at all, it's very nonlinear. And the second one, once you have a show that the, the uniqueness aspect is solved, you can ask whether or not uh, there is uh, some kind of uh, continuity of the inverse. This is the thing you, you want in practice. No? You, you are given two operators and you want to reconstruct the conductivities. So it's reasonable to, to wonder whether or not if two operators are close to each other, the corresponding conductivities will be also close to each other. So phrased in an abstract way, this is simply uh, asking whether or not you have a modulus, a local modulus of continuity, okay, for this map phi minus one. Okay. And the third one, so uh, you would like uh, to, to have a, a formula, a procedure for computing phi minus one, okay? And very closely related to this to this uh, aspect, there is the, the problem of characterizing the range of this map. So you see uh, this map sends uh, conductivities to operators, but essentially uh, you have to imagine uh, that the, the image by, by phi of your conductivities is, is a kind of manifold in this infinite dimensional space of operators. So you have this manifold that is going to be very small. You will see in a moment, give you evidence for that. So, of course, in practice, uh, you are given some kind of operator that usually is perturbed, is not really going to be a, a very faithful representation of a direct to number map. So, uh, a good thing to do in order to solve this problem numerically would be to project uh, your data onto the manifold of direct to number maps and then push back uh, with phi minus one. Okay, so this aspect of characterizing the range is also very important. Of course, it's uh, if you know a little bit of uh, inverse spectral theory, for instance, you know this kind of issue is in general very hard to, to prove. So I've just stated it because I think it's interesting, but of course uh, it's out of reach. So I I'll give you a very, 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 very rough lead to, to the literature because the literature is immense. There are many, many good people that have worked on this problem, many on this room also. So I, I will just be very sketchy. So I. I ask you for your forgiveness, please. I'm going to, to make just a few references here. So I just want to tell you that the, the problem is, is known to be uh, solved. The uniqueness aspect is known to be, to be, uh, to be uh, solved when uh, everything is analytic. Okay? So if everything is analytic, uh, there is this result by Kahn and Morelius that tells you uh, uh, phi, the mapping uh, phi is, is injective when you restrict yourself to to analytic conductivities and the boundary of your domain is analytic and so on. So, so uh, another interesting paper is the is this paper by Astal and by Varinta in 2006. So they solved the problem in dimension two. In dimension two, the answer is yes, uh, with a very general class of conductivities. Okay, the ones I stated before. And uh, in general, the problem is open. And there are some examples of non-uniqueness. So there is a nice example by Dodé, Cabran, and Nicolo. So in dimension greater or equal than three, they, they give an example of non-uniqueness, but in the case in which you have a manifold with boundary, 
the boundary having uh, several connected components, and you input some current in some connected component of the boundary, and you measure in some other connected component. In this case, they, they, they are able to produce examples in which uh, the map phi is not injected. Okay? Of course, uh, since this is a very hard problem, people from the very beginning uh, restrict it to a simpler case. So the simpler case is that uh, you assume that your metric is conformally Euclidean and you try to recover the conformal factor from everything. So this is uh, 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 it's easier, but uh, not easy. And uh, in fact, uh, well, the uh, first result in this direction is by Silverstein and Ullmann, where they showed that uh, you have uniqueness in dimensions three or more when the, the conformal factor gamma mm -hmm. is infinity. And then, uh, I mean, there is kind of a competition in analysis, so to try to, to get the lowest regularity possible for gamma and show uniqueness. So I, uh, maybe I'm a little result by Aberman and by my friends Carlo and Rogers. I think they are currently the world champions on, on this competition. I don't know. So they showed that this is the case when you have a Lipschitz conductivity. Okay. And uh, Russell Brand conjectured that, uh, in fact, uh, it's reasonable to, to have uniqueness in this uh, class of conductivities, uh, W and D. But I think this is not known uh, so far. Okay, so this is uniqueness. So stability. So uh, stability also has a huge literature, and here I'm, I'm going to be even more sketchy, so apologies again. So the, probably one of the first results on, on the stability issue for the Calderon problem is the, the result by Alessandrini. So essentially Alessandrini shown that the modulus of continuity that you can have on compact sets is a kind of a logarithmic. Okay? It's a very bad modulus of continuity from a numerical point of view. Okay? And this is somewhat optimal. Okay? So, so this is not even holder, it's a logarithm, it's not very nice. <coughs> and, uh, and the reconstruction aspect is much more or less uh, explored from the analytical point of view, but uh, from the numerical point of view, of course, it is paramount, it is very important. And uh, maybe the pioneering works in this area are the ones by Nachman, who really uh, found uh, an effective way of implementing these uh, the, 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 the strategy I'm going to tell you uh, next for probing uniqueness into an effective algorithm. And there is a very closely related work by Novikov on the same issue. And of course, you have uh, many variants of this problem that are very interesting, very difficult. <coughs> uh, anything you can imagine uh, can be related to this problem. So, okay. So I'm going to focus here in this talk in this third aspect, okay, the reconstruction aspect. So, very closely related to the problem of characterizing which operators are Dirichlet to Neumann operators. So, this was our original motivation was this, in fact. We started thinking about this problem two years ago, and we said, okay, let's, let's see what we can do in this uh, characterization problem. Uh, we didn't do much, but uh, I will tell you what we did. And, and in fact, since... Uh, in our group, there are some people doing numerical analysis. This was also motivation. I mean, to see what we could say in this aspect in order to eventually develop numerical algorithms. And as you will see, uh, this is essentially uh, the ones that uh, are known so far involve uh, are quite difficult to implement because uh, in the end you have to solve uh, some very oscillatory integral equations. So integral equations with, with very oscillatory kernels, and this is not always uh, easy to do. Okay, so, so this is what I'm going to talk about, and I will focus on the easiest possible case. So the first reduction to easiness is to assume this conformal Euclidean hypothesis on the metric. Okay, I will assume this from now on. So I'm going to, to, to be interested in the easy, easy well, part of the Calderon problem. Okay. So I'm going to tell you uh, how one usually proves uniqueness using the ideas that go back to Sylvester and Newman. I will formulate this maybe in a more up-to-date uh, uh, terminology. And, and uh, motivated by this, this scheme, uh, you will see uh, there is things that you can do in order to understand the range problem and the, and the effective uh, reconstruction problem. So 
remember what we want to do. So we want to recover gamma from the knowledge of the Dirichlet to normal map associated to this operator. Okay, this is what we want to do. And I'm going to show you that uh, if you know the Dirichlet to normal operator, then you know uniquely gamma. I didn't mention it before, but when you are conformally Euclidean, uh, this Gauge invariance that you had uh, in the general case is no longer present here, okay? Because uh, if I apply a diffeomorphism to, to some conformally Euclidean metric, I uh, will get something that is not uh, conformally Euclidean anymore. So here you, you really aim for showing that this, is, this coefficient here is uniquely determined by the Dirichlet to normal map. So the first thing you do is you change variables. So you do this change of variables and you compute and you see that this function u that is obtained from the solution of this problem satisfies a Schrodinger equation, okay? Where the potential is obtained via the conductivity by this relation. So you see why I written uh, C2? It's because I need two derivatives in my conductivity in order to make, sen make sense of this, okay? And then uh, you simply compute again and you see that the Dirichlet to normal map associated now to this operator uh, is related to the Dirichlet normal map of this operator by this very nice formula. So you have a formula that relates the two, and from this formula you can see that uh, this guy uniquely determines this guy and vice versa. Okay, so uh, obtaining lambda q and obtaining lambda, I mean obtaining uh, uh, q from uh, the Dirichlet to Neumann map is the same as obtaining gamma from the Dirichlet to Neumann map. Okay, so now we focus in this problem where we don't have any uh, metric anymore, but we have a Schrodinger operator, which is simpler from a PDE point of view, and then you use integration by parts. So in this community, uh, this is called, this is integration by parts, this is called Alessandrini's identity, okay? So it simply says that, uh, okay, see, I, if I take uh, lambda q and I subtract lambda zero, so this is simply the Dirichlet to my map associated to the free Laplacian on omega. So if I consider this difference of two operators, apply it to a function and then to another function, and then this is uh, something that uh, you can see the potential appearing here. And u and v are simply uh, the solution to this guy, v the solution to this one, okay? So you have a, somewhat you have related the operator to the potential via this formula. Okay. This is the first step. Mm -hmm. So as I said, this is integration by parts, so it's a nice exercise for students. So second step, so this is the real analysis here uh, that is coming to play. So you, you, you construct a special class of solutions to, to these two PDEs that you are going to plug here. Uh, so these special solutions will... Uh, so you, in the end, the philosophy is that you, you show that there are a lot of solutions of, of these two equations and their products are somewhat dense. In the space of, I don't know, L1 or whatever you want, okay? So, so this is the idea. So you have to construct in a clever way solutions that allow you to determine uniquely the potential when you plug them into the formula we had before. So this is a variant of uh, WKB or geometric optics as you like. The only difference is that you allow the phases to be uh, complex, okay? uh, complex vectors. So you consider this quadrant in uh, CD. Uh, so you, are, you simply look at the vectors in CD so that when I do the component-wise product and I sum, I get zero. Okay? This is a quadric uh, in, a, in a complex, uh, complex space. Okay? So to each of these vectors, I associate a plane wave. Okay? So simply an exponential of zeta times x. So I will denote them by, by, by this. And in fact, uh, you can show that uh, if you take the Laplacian of this guy, you get zero because of this condition here. So the Laplacian of one of those is zero. It's an harmonic function. And the idea is to show that uh, there are uh, solutions of minus Laplacian plus Q equal to zero that are at first order like plane waves. It's just the usual WKV method, okay? But with complex phases. So in, in fact, you show that uh, uh, given any of these, you can produce a solution such that uh, uh, you have a, at first order the plane wave, and then you get some correction, and the correction tends to zero when h tends to zero. h is simply one over h is the modulus of the of the phase. Okay. 
Okay, so once uh, you show, this is the hard part. So you have to prove that these things exist and uh, you have to, to, to estimate the remainder. And fortunately, you don't have to go to a full uh, asymptotic development. You can stop at the, at the first remainder and you're good. So the, the third step is now you, you know Alessandrini's identity, you know the existence of uh, CGO solutions, complex geometric optic solutions. So now we reconstruct the potential. <coughs> So we, we do the following. So we take a two of these uh, vectors in the quadric. So these are complex vectors the, whose dot product uh, between themselves is zero. Okay? And I take them in such a way that this gives me uh, minus i h psi. Psi is something that I choose beforehand. Okay? I choose psi and then the other two guys. Okay? So this I can only do in dimension three or more because in dimension two there is not enough space okay, to to let uh, the module use, uh, so to have this H here uh, in dimension two, I can do it. This is a dimension three thing. And then I plug my, my things in Alessandrini's identity. So I take the restriction to the boundary of the complex geometric solution associated to Laplace and minus Q. I take the plane wave that is harmonic and I put it here and apply the identity and I get Q times the solution whose boundary data is this times the solution of the free Laplacian whose boundary data is this. Since uh, the phase satisfies the relation, I get, I get this. Okay? So I get Q complex exponential times things. I let, uh, now I let H tends to zero and what I find is that uh, so since this guy here tends to zero in L2, I get uh, the Fourier transform of Q. So from now on, I will make this big abuse of notation. So when I write a Q hat, what I'm really meaning is a Q times the characteristic function of omega hat. So I get the Fourier transform, and if I know the Fourier transform, I, I know Q. And there is a uniqueness because the Fourier transform, as you well know, is injective. And so this is the way uh, one proves uniqueness for the Calderon problem. Okay? So this approach, uh, so people who have been working in this issue during a long time uh, complain that this approach uh, uh, should be uh, avoided somewhat because you cannot really attack the, the anisotropic problem using this approach. So it's somewhat limited to this conformal equivalent metrics. And well, we would like to attack the, the real problem. And one can, uh, so what I've t told you here, of course, is not constructive, but you can make it constructive and you can have an algorithm. This, is, this was done by Nachman. Okay, but uh, still, uh, the approach doesn't tell you very well uh, what the manifold phi of C is. So this manifold of, uh, of operators, you don't know really what it is. And uh, also from the numerical point of view, so yes, this, this, this effective formula by Nachman is, is nice because you know that there is an effective procedure, but if you want to implement it, uh, it's not so easy, apparently. Here I'm telling you uh, what uh, have been reported by people doing numerics. So I, I don't know it uh, firsthand. So here starts what, we, what we've done. Okay, so the idea is uh, to do a formal thing that people uh, working in scattering theory do all the time. And this is called the bone approximation. So the idea, so you, you, you go back to Alessandrini's identity Sorry. So, well, you go back here better. Uh, sorry. Huh? <coughs> so here. So you see, when I let uh, h tend to zero, here I get uh, the Fourier transform of q. Okay. So the idea is simply, you know, instead of of uh, writing this thing that so this guy to in order to compute it, I need to know q, uh, because this is a solution to minus Laplace and plus q. So I have to know q. So we said, okay. Uh, it's, not a problem, we, we replace this guy by a plane wave, okay? by a harmonic function. So this is what, what the Born approximation is. Of course, this is a completely uh, a formal thing, a completely heuristic. It's, uh, there, there is no basis for, for writing what I've written here, because you don't even know that this limit exists. Okay? So, but uh, well, physicists uh, do this all the time. They 
compute and they get uh, some uh, nice uh, pictures and they say, okay, this is fantastic. Let's, let's see. So, okay, so, well, if, if this thing works, this is very good because you don't need to, to solve a complicated integral equation to get uh, information on the potential. And, uh, of course, uh, as I said, this is pretty formal and I have written here a Fourier transform. But, uh, very, even if this converges, there is no a priori, uh, not any reason that this guy is a temperate distribution. So this Fourier transform thing is a purely formal thing. I mean, there is no reason to have this there. But uh, people have done computations with well, uh, formula related to this one and, and showed that it works. And from more, a more analytic point of view, there are, there are some papers, one by Novikov and Novikov, and a nice paper by, by Harlaf <coughs> and Seo, where they introduce a similar approach and, and they say, okay, provided this thing exists, then you can derive some properties on. And it's, a, it's an interesting paper. So what we wanted to, 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 to do is uh, to, to use this as a starting point to, to, get, to get some information on the problem of characterizing the range of phi, the manifold of Dirichlet to Neumann. So this is what we did. What was D? What was D? Sorry? What was the, the domain? The domain was D is omega? Or? Ah, sorry. This is, uh, yes, this D, D, is, D is omega, yes. If you take zeta 1 and 2 depending on age? Sorry? You take zeta 1 and 2 depending on age because you... No, 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 they are in the... Well, yes, they, de they can depend on age. But uh, they depend on age... Uh, if, if you let these two guys depend on age, they have to vary in a compact set. I'm being a bit sloppy here, okay? I'm not being precise. But uh, you, can, you can remove this guy here and, and simply... Uh, well, they will depend on age, but uh, they will vary in a compact set and it's not important. You will see it's not a big issue. So yes, this is my 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 uh, collaborator likes D and and I hate D and I write omega and sometimes I forget to erase these and write omegas. So so this is what happened. So what we are going to do here? We are going to simplify the problem uh, uh, even more. So instead of looking a general domain or manifold with boundary, I'm going to consider the ball. Euclidean space. And then I'm going, so the, the boundary is the sphere, okay? The sphere is nice, and there is a nice thing because uh, if you have a domain, then you can embed it into some ball, and there is a relationship between, between the Dirichlet to Neumann map of your domain and the Dirichlet to Neumann map of your ball. This is something that was uh, studied by Stein. And so, at the end, it's not a crazy thing to look at these. these so of course, if you want to have a well-defined Dirichlet to Neumann map, you have to assume that this Schrodinger operator, so that zero is not a, an eigenvalue of this Schrodinger operator, otherwise the Dirichlet to Neumann map is not well-defined. So this is an hypothesis you have to make. And the very interesting case, in fact, is when your potential is properly supported inside the ball. Okay, so there is a, there's a support, so the, the potential vanishes in the neighborhood of the boundary. This is a, the problem that uh, is quite interesting, in fact. So, okay, so we, so we are going to do the, ult the, 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 the ultimate simplification of the problem, which is supposing that uh, the potential is invariant by the symmetries of the ball. So you, you are going to suppose that everything is a rotation invariant, okay? So the potential is simply a radial function. So I think we cannot simplify it more unless we put a constant or zero. So this is enough, and we are going to, to try to see what, what we can do in this very simple case, okay? So, well, this case is nice because since the, the Laplacian commutes with the isometries of the sphere, so the Dirichlet to Neumann map also commutes with rotations. And if you have an operator that commutes with all rotations, you can show that it's simply a function of the Laplacian on the sphere, okay? So this is the first thing. So the Dirichlet to Neumann map in this very simple case is a Fourier multiplier of the sphere, so the function of the Laplacian. In particular, the eigenfunctions are the same eigenfunctions as the Laplacian on the sphere, and the only difference are the eigenvalues. So once you know the spectrum of the Dirichlet to Neumann map, you know the operator completely. So this is a huge simplification. Okay? So in the end, if you want to characterize, for instance, the manifold of the Dirichlet to Neumann maps, it suffices to characterize the spectra of the operator. You don't need to do anything else. Okay, so the free case. 
the free case, uh, the spectrum is simply the natural numbers. Okay, so good. And notation. So lambda k q is simply the k eigenfunction function of this guy. Okay, the f the corresponding eigenfunction function with q equals zero is simply the natural number k. So first thing one has to do in order to understand the problem is to to solve the direct problem. I mean, is to understand uh, the spectrum of the Dirichlet to Neumann map. So we did this thing first, and we obtained the following result. So, so you see, this is the spectrum on this side. This is the spectrum of lambda q minus lambda zero. It's the operator that appeared in Alessandrini's formula. So we proved that the difference between these two guys is this one, which is the 2k moment of q times a series that converges. And you can, if you are, if you like uh, doing hard computations, you can, uh, you can compute these guys if you want. Uh, but uh, well, we, we simply estimated them. So the relevant thing on this estimate is that this is uh, this term that is the, so k is fixed and moves. So the nth term here is like a power of n in respect to q. Okay, it's a monomial of a power n with respect to q. Okay? And these guys, you see, they, they decay with respect to k. Okay? So first thing you can see from the above estimate is that the difference between uh, lambda kq and lambda 0 is something that tends to 0. For the operator, this operator is always compact. And this is not, uh, this is, was already known. Huh? It's not, uh, <coughs> and if the support is properly contained in the ball, then the, the, the eigenvalues tend exponentially fast to zero. So this means that the operator is smoothing to a order. So you see, that, that, that tells you that uh, the problem is going to be difficult because uh, this kind of thing, if you want to use so differential operators, which, which would be the, the thing I would like to do, tells you that this is going to be difficult because uh, classical absolute differential operators won't see uh, anything here. Okay? The symbol of this guy is going to be zero. And everything is going to be uh, uh, compacted, compressed in some exponentially small reminder term. Uh, you could do analytic so differential operators and in the end this is something one has to, to do in, to understand this problem. But, uh, the only thing that one and one has to realize also is that if you look now the difference between these eigenvalues and the moments of the potential, this thing is a further Q square uh, and tends to zero. So this is telling you that if you look at this map, the map that maps uh, potential to operators, so Q is mapped to lambda Q minus lambda zero, is, uh, is differential, uh, is differential, is, is going to be to do the following. It's going to send a potential to an operator, and the operator is going to be the self-adjoint compact operator that is uh, invariant by rotations on, uh, on the sphere. So this should be a sphere, sorry, uh, whose spectrum are the moments. So the linear map is going to map potentials to operators whose spectra are uh, the moments of the potential. Okay. So this is the first thing one has to, to understand. So second thing. So in fact, in this very simple case, you can compute everything by hand. And there is no limit here. In fact, this is an identity. This thing here is independent of H. And it's equal to this function there. Okay? So this is the second thing you can compute. So this is nice because, you see, this, we don't know anything about this guy here. But this series, we know it converges absolutely. So this is going to be an entire function. Okay? Uh, it could be an entire function that grows uh, very uh, super exponentially at infinity. So this wouldn't make sense. But uh, this is an entire function. Okay? And it depends only of the spectrum of, of the directlet to Neumann map. Okay? So this for computing is fantastic. So you see this any, anybody can do. No? You program your series and you compute it and fantastic. And, and well, I've written here the proof, but I'm not going to bother you. So I, I just want to emphasize that in this case, this is very simple. It's simply a nice game with spherical harmonics. If you like spherical harmonics, it's very easy. And it's simply a computation, okay? But the, the, the very nice thing is that 
Now, the, the, if you take Q, the potential, and compute its Fourier transform, then you get exactly the same formula as before, but instead of the spectrum, you get the moments of the potential. Okay? So, so okay, so the formula we use to reconstruct the, this Born approximation is simply you take this formula for the potential, and instead of putting the moments of the potential, which you don't, you don't know, you put the spectrum of the Dirichlet to normal map. So what, what, what it means? It means that this Born approximation we just defined is simply the function, if it exists, whose moments are the eigenvalues of the Dirichlet to normal map. Okay? So this is the, the thing. So more conceptually, this is the, the factorization we are introducing. Okay? So far, nothing is very rigorous. I will do it later. But conceptually speaking, this is what we are going to do. What I would like to compute is this phi minus one, no? that maps operators to the potential. Okay, so is this map here? So I'm going to factor it into map. The first map is going essentially to be the, this differential of phi at zero minus one. So this map takes an operator here and maps it to the function if it exists, whose moments are the spectrum of the operator, okay? And the other map is a nonlinear map. This one is linear, it's the differential of something. And this one is nonlinear and maps this Born approximation, the function whose moments are the eigenvalues of the operator, to the potential. And this one is nonlinear, okay? So there is a factorization here. So you may complain and you can say, okay, but uh, differential of this guy is only defined on the tangent plane. So how you do to, to extend it? So I'm going to, to show you that you can do it. Uh, you, you should imagine this as a, you have a surface in R3 and you have the tangent plane and you have a map defined on the tangent plane to somewhere else. And what we do is simply like consider a, a neighborhood of the tangent plane. This neighborhood of the tangent plane is going to intersect your surface in some neighborhood of, of the origin. And in this neighborhood, we are going to invert this map. We are going to show that you can extend it and invert it, okay? This is what we are going to do. Okay, so, yeah, as, as I said, so the first part here is what is known as the Hausdorff moment problem. Given a sequence of real numbers, the eigenvalues of an operator of this kind, you map it to the functions whose moments are these eigenvalues. It is a very famous inverse problem. It's very well known that this is very, has very bad stability properties, like a logarithmic stability, just as the Calderon problem. And the other one is a nonlinear guy. Yeah? And for, for the moment, this is very mysterious. Yeah? But if you like numerical analysis, this is the end of the story for you, because you go and you compute and you say, OK, this is very easy to implement numerically. No? This is given, uh, so this is our formula. You plug uh, the numbers in some series and you get uh, this function. And then this is simply a fixed point iteration. And so you, you can, it's very easy to compute. So you, you compute and these are some examples. For instance, uh, the, the blue line is Q, the red line is QS. So here you have some Gibbs phenomenon, but because we are truncating the series, it's normal to, to have this, okay? And, so you see uh, things go well here close to the boundary. This is the boundary one. And when you go to the interior, you deviate. So this one and the previous one, the only difference is the, the infinity norm of the potential. You see here it's 0.7 and here is eight. So error is bigger, but this is to be expected because we are somewhat using some kind of linearization. So it's normal that if potentials are big, uh, things is going to be worse. And well, so there are different things to do. I don't, want, I don't want to focus very much on that. Simply look at this one. So this is for the conductivity case. You can do the same for conductivities, okay? So we have here three conductivities, which coincide up to here and then deviate. So the Born approximations do the same, okay? So well, apparently there is some structure, and so this uh, told us that uh, there should be a theorem. So one year ago, more or less, uh, I, I told this story uh, in a conference that Colin organized, and in the audience uh, there were uh, Thierry Daudet and François Nicolo. And uh, okay, so we discussed, and 
started working together and we proved some theorems, okay, together with my friend Cristobal Meloño. So the first theorem is that everything I told you uh, makes sense. Okay, the commutative diagram makes sense. It's not uh, uh, something uh, that we dreamt. It, 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 it really happens. Okay, so the first thing, so, you, so now this is going to be the one approximation. And I, this is not a typo, okay? I use a different notation because the object is going to be slightly different. Uh, but uh, not very much different from the one I introduced before. So first thing, we said, okay, so you, you take a Q, you consider the Dirichlet to Neumann map, then we can prove that there exists a unique function that uh, such that the, the moments starting from some constant that depends on the norm, essentially, of Q, are exactly the eigenvalues of the Dirichlet to Neumann map. And this function is going to be uh, in L1, except possibly at the origin, where it can have a big singularity. This can happen, okay? So this is the first thing. So this map here is well-defined, and the target space A is this weighted L1 space, okay? Second thing, the, the other map, the nonlinear part, in fact, is bijective, and it's even more than that, okay? If you have two potentials <coughs> that coincide in some neighborhood of the boundary, then the Born approximation coincides as well, and reciprocally. Okay? If two Born approximations coincide in some annulus close to the boundary, then the potential must coincide also in the same annulus. Okay? As the first thing is this. So this is called local uniqueness for the Calderon problem, and this was already uh, proved in a different context, but very related to this one by Donini Colon Camran in a paper in 2019. So. This is the first thing. Second thing, so you would like to compare Q and the Born approximation. So this is what we do here. So we prove the following. So Q, the Born approximation is essentially the potential plus a continuous function that may blow up at the origin. Okay. So what does this mean? So if this guy is discontinuous, then this guy here must have exactly the same discontinuities. QB captures exactly the discontinuity points of the potential. And in general, you can do this in any irregularity, okay? And you have a quantitative estimate for the difference. So you have this estimate that is very good close to the boundary and gets worse close to the interior. And this is related again to this constant beta that depends on the potential. This is the second result. And the third result is that the mapping that sends the Born approximation to the potential the nonlinear mapping is always holder continuous. So this is a holder continuous mapping, no matter what happens. So in general, uh, if you have two potentials, you can estimate the difference by the difference of the Born approximations to some power. So this is a holder continuous map. So this is going, this is telling you a lot of things, no? It's telling you, in fact, that the, 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 the phenomenon that is responsible for the bad stability properties of the Calderon problem is precisely the Hausdorff moment problem part. The nonlinear part is good, is holder, but the, the linear part is very bad. And in fact, the, the stability properties of the, this Calderon problem are going to be detected solely where of the, by the stability properties of the, moment, of the Hausdorff moment problem. So depending on which class of potentials you, you pose your Hausdorff moment problem, you are going to get one kind of stability or another. This one is universal. So this is this linear part does not depend on, on anything. Well, I didn't mention, but uh, so this is the regularity uh, that is. So we can we can handle less regular things, but it's a bit ugly to, to write down. So I I wrote the setting that is perhaps simpler. Okay. Okay. So so well, what what how do you prove this? So. The thing is that uh, when you are radial, you can reduce everything to studying spectral theory of 1D Schrodinger operators on the half line. And this is a subject that Barry Simon studied a lot at the beginning of the 2000s. And he has a series of papers that are beautiful, I recommend them. And where he really uh, understands uh, the interspectral theory for the, the operators, okay? So the nice thing is that we, we, we have given, in a very, very simple setting, uh, uh, an approach that uh, 
allows you to, to more or less attack all the issues in the Calderon problem without using the complex geometric optics. So one thing we would like to do is to try to understand uh, in which generality you can build something like this. And of course, this is telling you something about the range because in the radial case, the range is simply trying to understand which sequences of real numbers are moment sequences for some, some, some function. And this is known. There is a nice paper by Bowen where it's completely characterized. So you have a local characterization around the origin of the manifold of Dirichlet to Neumann maps. Okay. So, okay, this is what I told you. So they, ah, the, the, these two guys are different, but the difference is a simply a distribution of finite order so supported in the origin. Okay. So the guy defined by the series and the guy given by the theorem are the same, except for maybe a combination of deltas and derivatives of finite order. Okay? And uh, so yes, this is uh, perhaps the most interesting thing. So you get this factorization that uh, allows you to understand uh, how the stability of the Calderon problem works. So essentially, if you restrict uh, the class of potentials to some class where the problem is well posed, you will get a holder stability in the end. Okay. okay, so you can do also these things at fixed energy. This is something we're doing with Daniel Sanchez Mendoza and Cristobal Meronio. So this is a more semi-classical thing, but I, I won't not have time to tell you what we obtained, but we, there is some kind of semi-classical uh, born approximation that can be defined and you have uh, nice properties. It's more involved because the explicit calculations are much more difficult, okay? But uh, we can do it. So just to finish, so I have a, uh, how, how, how much time? Five minutes? Five minutes, okay. So, of course, uh, what I explained is a very simple case, okay? So in dimension two, we can do everything I've, I explained you. In fact, uh, you, can, you can do many things in dimension two, but still we, we are trying to understand very well the problem in that case. And the uh, interesting thing to do is what happens uh, when you are not radial, okay? And so in dimension two, uh, there is a way of approaching this problem we are trying to, to understand. But in dimension three, uh, there is a way that is simply uh, trying to understand directly this expression, okay? This, this was valid only in dimension three or more, okay? So we try to do this. So I explain to you what is the idea to attack the problem in general. So, okay, so you have to understand one thing. So the Calderon problem is uh, you have an operator defined on the boundary and you want to recover the potential. So the operator is given by an integral kernel. So the integral kernel is uh, a function of uh, two times the d minus one variables, okay? Because we are in the d minus one sphere. So d minus one, two times. And you want to recover a function of... Uh, uh, of d variables. So this is okay in dimension two because you have exactly the same number of variables in both sides. But in dimension three, the problem is overdetermined because the integral kernel has four variables and the potential has three variables. So this is telling you that uh, there is too much information and you should throw some information away in order to get some kind of bijection there, okay? And uh, so the, the question is how you throw the information in a meaningful way. So we, we came up with this, this idea. So in fact, you have to realize that the Fourier transform has an invariance that is encoded in the Fourier transform. So if you take a vector of direction omega, omega is a vector in the sphere, and you look at the Fourier transform uh, evaluated in vectors that are proportional to this omega. So if you take any rotation that fixes omega, uh, and you rotate your potential, the Fourier transforms are going to coincide. So this is a property that the Fourier transform has. So if you want uh, that the bond approximation is something meaningful, it should have the same invariance, okay? If you want it to, to be similar to the Fourier transform. Fortunately, uh, there is no way you have this invariance, okay? It's not possible. You don't have this invariance. So since we don't have it, we force it. So we introduce a, a way of averaging uh, the operator. So this is a... Uh, Classical, I mean, uh, idea in uh, semi-classical mechanics. <coughs> you have a periodic flow, you have a periodic quantum flow, and you consider an average of your operator. So, which is the flow here? It's simply the, the so you take, uh, uh, so okay, so the, the rotations that fix on omega are simply uh, 
the, the ones generated by the angular momentum with respect to this direction omega. So we average the operator along the angular momentum and this is the thing we're going to look at. And well, uh, it's a bit overwhelming, the, the next slide. So, so this has the good invariance, just, just to, to let you know. This has the, exactly the good invariance you, you're looking for. And, and now, so we, we, what we did is to, to compute the matrix elements of the Dirichlet to Neumann map in some basis of spherical harmonics that depend on this omega. Okay? So we did this. And we show that, so there are some moments that are defined for this problem. Now, moments uh, can, define, can depend on the angular variable as well. So we get uh, some, some result that is analogous to the spectral result in the radial case, but for matrix elements in this case. And, uh, and uh, the thing is that the, the Born approximation and the Fourier transform enjoy the same properties as in the radial case, okay? So you have uh, the same formula for both the Fourier transform and the Born approximation. The only difference is that here you plug some matrix elements, here you plug some moments. But you have exactly the, the same structure, okay? So you can do also this thing when you are in a semi-classical regime, when you are at high energies, you can do the same. Uh, the expression is much more uglier, but uh, you can do it. And the idea now would be to, to try to, to get the same result we obtain with uh, Dode and Nicolo, but for this kind of approximation. This is, of course, a much more difficult problem, but this is what we would like to do. So thank you for your attention. Do we have some questions for Fabrizio? characterization near, uh, so you said that, uh, you know, it, it is uh, given by this, um, this moment, possible moments, but is there some sort of like, let's say, more geometric interpretation of this? Uh? Uh, I would like to, I, we, are, we are trying to, to get this kind of thing, but for the moment, no, it's simply, a, so it's simply a, the operator in the radial case is completely characterized by the spectrum, mm -hmm. which are the spectra of this operator. The spectra must be moments of some uh, class of distributions. And there is no much more uh, than that. I mean, it's a pu pu purely analytical thing. The, uh, the, maybe I forgot to mention a very nice paper by Kudinov, where he does this characterization problem in the somewhat uh, diametrically opposed case. So if you are in a domain or in a two-dimensional manifold with boundary, and you look at uh, uh, the directly to Neumann map associated to a Laplace Beltrami operator, then Sharafuddinov uh, characterizes these operators. But uh, you should note that in dimension two, uh, being, a Dirich, uh, being a Laplace Beltrami is not the same as being divergence of something uh, times gradient. Dimension two is exactly the dimension where the two problems are not equivalent. The, the, the problem for Riemannian metrics and the problem for divergence form operators are equivalent if and only if dimension is three or more. So the, the result by Sharafuddinov, which is beautiful, is more geometrical than ours because he essentially tells you that uh, uh, the directly to Neumann map in that case is the free directly to Neumann map times a function. So instead of being a Fourier multiplier, is a multiplication operator, and then you conjugate it by some DFO in the boundary. Okay, this is what uh, Sharafuddinov proves. But uh, in dimension two, our case is, and the case of Sharafuddinov have intersection, the identity only. Okay? This is a, so it's an interesting problem. But I, I think this one, the one we studied, is less geometrical than, than the other one, which is more appealing. You probably mentioned, but the range of the map phi in your case is known to be closed or? To be closed. Yeah. No, I don't think so. Huh? Mm -hmm. It's a very nasty uh, <laughs> thing. But you can close. I mean, depending uh, with respect to the norm of topology, no? In the of operators. I don't think so. Whatever topology it makes it close. I don't know. Yeah, no, no, I think uh, finding the good topology that makes it close is it's related to understanding the range. But in general, it's not going to be. Because you, 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 when you define this linearization, you use the tangent space. Yes. 
to the range of fight. Me metaphor, huh? This, this okay. was like a metaphor okay. of, to, to yeah. understand it in the geometrical terms. Okay. Uh, I would say that this tangent plane is going to be a very nasty, non closed thing. Gabriel? Okay. 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 So, so, the first is just one quick comment. So, I think in Sharafuddinov's case, what makes everything possible is the mapping. Yes, yes, yes. But the second, in dimension two, that you know that this is a Neumann map, you know, has this sort of kernels, is there a conjecture about what the kernel should satisfy? Was some work in the 90s on this, yes. on this resistor networks? Uh, yes, yes, there is some work by. Uh, so, that conjecture is still open, is it? So there is a paper, Dimension 2, by some student of Nachman, uh, but uh, I'm not sure it's 100% uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I've, I've been asking people and nobody has, gave me, has given me a definite answer. I mean, is, is there a sort of general picture of what you believe the range should be, or you don't even have a conjecture? Uh, uh, Just in dimension 2, about what that kernel should look like. I think it's got, people know it's a Lagrangian manifold. Um, I mean, it says that it's Lagrangian with respect to the natural symplectic form. You can put in space of compact operators. I don't know. I really. Uh, so we have some ideas, but uh, I don't know. I, I would like to understand better the, the problem. But uh, I, so far, I, I haven't been able to find a, a good conjecture. I mean, the radial case at the end is a matter of uh, understanding these moment sequences, or if you do it in the, for conductivity, is understanding uh, zeros of analytic functions. So it's very related to the fact that this is a 1D problem, and the spectral theory of these problems is essentially that. In the general case, uh, there is a, the only result of this kind I know is uh, something by Barry Simon. Another author, so sorry, I forgot it's his name. So what they characterize uh, the spectral measure of Toplitz matrices, things like that. So they have a theorem. It's a beautiful paper, but the theorem is like one page with uh, like uh, six, seven conditions. Uh, very different one from the other. Very mysterious. And they say here, the measure is the spectral measure of the Toplitz operator, if I may list of... Uh, so I, I guess that... Uh, there is no reason that for this problem you get, you get a simple answer. No, I, I think it's going to be difficult. It's going to be. A, we cannot use so differential operators in the smooth setting. Okay. No more questions. Thanks, Fabrizio. Thank you.